Zack Snyder creates a fresh universe in Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. It is unlike any other sci-fi movie, which is all about gaining control of the throne. Nope, not this one. Rebel Moon gives us new languages, places, weapons, and technology. It takes real-world aspects of farming and black marketing of food and gives it an intergalactic twist. Teaming up with writers Kurt Johnstad and Jay Hatton, Snyder creates a story full of mythology spanning thousands of years. This lays the foundation for an entirely new Rebel Moon universe on Netflix. Similar to other fictional worlds like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, Rebel Moon introduces numerous new concepts, including at least four new languages developed by Snyder for the film. In this episode, we're going to look into the story and everything there is about Rebel Moon. Are you guys ready? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. What is the movie all about? In a distant star system existed the Mother World. It was a militaristic empire that was shaped by centuries of war and conflict. However, they saw a moment of hope with the birth of Princess Issa because she possessed a rare gift of resurrection and healing. Issa is thought of as a potential source of redemption, suggesting that there may be a chance to unite the Empire through compassion instead of using force. However, during her ceremony of taking on her role as the ruler, Issa and her parents are brutally assassinated. Soon, Belisarius, a powerful military leader, declares himself as the new head of state. With the support of Admiral Atticus Noble, a ruthless military leader, Belisarius renews the Empire's aggressive attitude and discards any plans of peaceful unification. On the other side of the universe, there was an independent planet of Velt. Noble and his forces soon arrived and demanded grain from Father Sindri, the local village leader. However, Sindri was a wise man. He knew that giving them grain supplies simply meant that the farmers, too, were feeding the war. When Sindri says no, Gunnar, an ambitious farmer, opens up about the surplus grain stock in the village that is just piling up and soon they will run out of storage. This angers the noble and in a fit of rage he kills Sindri. Furthermore, he instructs Gunnar to ready the grains in a few weeks. Our protagonist, Korra, a former member of the Imperium, witnesses the brutality of noble soldiers against the villagers and decides to resist and even kill every one of them. She reveals her Imperium background to the villagers and sets out to raise an army to defend Velt. Soon, Korra and Gunnar travel to a nearby port town to assemble a group of warriors. They begin by recruiting a smuggler named Kai a beast tamer, Tarak, a cyborg swordswoman, Nemesis, and a disgraced Imperium commander, Titus. They form a diverse team and a strong team, but Korra is still burdened by guilt over Princess Isa's death. She shares her past as the princess's bodyguard and her failure to perform her duties. These warriors are well aware of the fact that they cannot defeat the noble's powerful ship, the King's Gaze, so they ask for assistance from Clan Bloodaxe, led by siblings Darian and Debra. While Darian agrees to help them, Debra retreats because she thinks the fight is futile and it won't be a fair fight against the massive weaponry of the noble. Right when things are falling in place, Kai, having intended to betray the group for bounties, captures them at an unregistered trading post. However, our farm fighter Gunner intervenes and after a fierce battle, Korra throws Noble off a high platform. He survives the fall but is gravely injured. Noble is recovered by Mother World forces. They sent him to Belisarius where the two communicated in what looked like an icy dimension. Belisarius demanded an end to the insurgency and to bring back his adoptive daughter, Korra, to life for execution. The warriors now determined to protect Velt faces challenges and betrayals as they navigate the obstacles of their mission. The fate of the Mother World hangs in the balance as they confront powerful enemies in their own troubled past. What do we know about the origin of this universe? Originally, the Imperium was based on the Mother World. They ruled for thousands of generations until they depleted their home planet's resources. They were forced to expand and open a wormhole in space that allowed a dreadnought ship to pass through. Jimmy, an ancient species of robot, explains how the royal bloodline's desire for power drove the Imperium to take over numerous unknown planets to spread the so-called glory of the Mother World. In the Imperium's long history, an ancient queen named Issa, believed to possess the ability to give life, was born from the royal bloodline. Legend referred to her as the Life Giver. During the thousands of generations, an order of robots known as the Jimmies served the king with every kilobyte of loyalty in them. The prophecy said Princess Isa would bring back Queen Isa's power and bring a new era of peace and compassion to the galaxy. Part 1 has not indicated much about this prophecy. However, there are a lot of loose ends that leave plenty of room for Part 2. 
Why is Korra fighting her adoptive father? The Imperium conquered planet after planet in the universe. They enslaved its people and even abducted them into the king's army. Belisarius, the top military leader, wasn't a desk general. He firmly believed in leading his troops on the battlefield. As a result, he personally led attacks on many planets and conquered them. During one such battle, he brutally killed an entire population, including Korra's family. But when he discovered Korra, he chose to train her instead of killing her like the others. Very Thanos-like, right? Korra excelled at the Academy Militarium and became Princess Isa's personal bodyguard. However, she never forgot what Belisarius did to her people and her family. The king believed in Isa's prophecy, hoping she would bring love and compassion and end the war. However, Isa's parents were assassinated and Belisarius became the new Imperium Regent. This is when Korra disappears, when vengeance is still sparking deep inside her. She later lands on Velt and hides among the farmers. Her story unfolds further when Admiral Atticus Noble arrives at Velt in search of the Blood Axe siblings. Is Korra the first one to fight against the Imperium? It isn't revealed until Korra sets out to gather a team that there are other rebels who are preparing and waiting for the right time to strike. Devra Bloodaxe and Darian Bloodaxe are two of those rebels who lead a small rebel force against the Imperium. They are striving to resist Regent Belisarius and Admiral Noble as far as they can. Despite their limited numbers and artillery that is subpar to the Admiral's army, they find shelter on the planet Sharon, which focuses on spirituality rather than war under the rule of King Levitica. This planet serves as a sanctuary for the insurgents. While other hideouts of resistance exist in the galaxy, they often lack the teamwork that is seen in the Blood Act Rebellion. General Titus, who was once a commander in the Imperium forces, staged a rebellion against the Mother World. When he surrendered, his army was brutally slaughtered. As a result, he chose exile and became a gladiator on the planet Pollux. This complex network of resistance, even though they believe it to be impossible to defeat the Imperium, builds a powerful yet ambiguous narrative in Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. The Rebels' recent win suggests they may face bigger challenges against the Imperium, setting the stage for an epic struggle in the Rebel Moon universe. The weapon and technology is the same as other sci-fi movie? Rebel Moon shows us a distinct weaponry system. These guns don't shoot regular bullets, obviously, or even energy blasts. Instead, they fire a superheated splash of plasma known as slag. When this unique ammunition hits organic matter like humans or even aliens, it burns deadly holes, instantly killing them. While on hard surfaces like walls, it splashes and creates small melted craters. Further, the swords wielded by characters like Nemesis and some Imperium soldiers are a little different from traditional designs. These energy-powered blades emit a blue glow when charged. However, Nemesis possesses a modified version of the weapon featuring robotic gutlets that replace her hands. These enhancements supercharge her sword, causing the blades to glow a vibrant orange-red. This added power allows the blade to effortlessly slice through almost anything like butter. While much of the Imperium's technology appears old and decaying, there are instances of excessively advanced tech. Although Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire doesn't look deeply into explanations on screen, it is pretty clear for sci-fi nerds like us that some of the Imperium's advanced technology has interdimensional origins. This high-tech equipment is linked to space travel, long-distance communication, and even medical functions. Admiral Atticus Noble, in particular, is rescued using this advanced technology as he is connected to a machine that has the extraordinary ability to bring him back to life after death. What can we expect in Part 2? Rebel Moon gives us a glimpse of a vast universe. Feeling like a small episode in a much larger series, the film's concept shows promises, yet it raises questions about where exactly it is headed. Whether it aims for the exploration and diplomacy of Star Trek or the political drama similar to Game of Thrones, this uncertainty adds an interesting element to the viewing, making you curious about the film's overall theme. This will surely make you want to watch Part 2. Even with the uncertainty, Rebel Moon manages to keep the audience engaged through its variety of elements. On the watchability scale, I would give it a rating of 6.5 points. Though not reaching the highest recommendation, the score indicates a moderate level of appeal. Rebel Moon provides a unique sci-fi adventure, potentially captivating viewers who enjoy such immersive tales. With the revival of Admiral Noel, there's a good possibility of him returning with a bang in Part 2. We're talking more tech, more drama, more politics, and even more revenge.
Marvelous Verdict In the first installment of Rebel Moon, we witness a storyline that goes beyond the typical sci-fi narrative. How often do you witness an intergalactic warship touching down on an unfamiliar planet in search of ration supplies for its army? In terms of the narrative, I must say, I'm impressed. From captivating battle sequences to dramatic childhood flashbacks, it is a well-crafted cinematic piece. The movie successfully establishes a connection with the audience. However, there are certain unexplained elements that require some amount of overlooking. Rebel Moon effectively lays the groundwork for the anticipated sequel. While the release date for Part 2 remains unknown, I believe Part 1 deserves ample time to gain recognition and carve out its own identity. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the freshly unveiled Rebel Moon Part 1. Until next time, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone!